Unit 1, Arrivals. Excuse me, Dolores Cotton? Yes. Hi, I'm Brad Jordan from Lemon Computers. How do you do? How do you do? I'm glad to meet you, Brad. Thank you for coming to meet us. It's a pleasure. How was the trip? Fine. Oh, I'd like you to meet Ron Eng. He's our sales manager. How do you do, Ron? Karen. Hi, Jody. How are you doing? Great. How are you? I haven't seen you for ages. I'm all right. Are you here to meet somebody? No. My mom just left for Miami. Do you have time for coffee? Sure. I'd love some. Margaret, hi. Hello, Carol. How are you? Oh, I'm okay. How are you getting along? Fine, thanks. How are Larry and the kids? Everybody's fine. My car is just outside. Let me take one of your bags. Oh, thanks. Careful, it's heavy. Hi. What time is your next flight to New York? 2.45. Flight 604 to LaGuardia Airport. There's space available. What's the one-way fare? It's $228.70 with tax. Okay. There you go. Put it on my visa card, please. All right. Just a second. Well, hi there. Uh, hello. How are you doing? Oh, fine. Uh, excuse me. Do I know you from somewhere? Sure, it's me, Rick Balestrina. I'm sorry. I don't think I know you. Aren't you Jose Cortez? No, I'm afraid not. Oh, excuse me. I thought you were someone else. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Unit 2. Is everything ready? This Is Your Life is a very popular show on American TV. Every week, they invite a well-known person to a TV studio. The person doesn't know that he or she will be the subject of the program. The host greets the person with, This is your life. The person then meets friends and relatives from the past and present. They tape the program before a live audience. The taping begins at 8 o'clock. It's 6.45 now, and the director is checking the preparations with her new production assistant. The subject of tonight's show will be an actor, William Payne. The host, as usual, will be Joe Campanero. Okay. We're bringing Bill Payne here in a rented limousine. He thinks he's coming to tape a talk show appearance. We've told the driver to arrive at exactly 7.55. The program begins at 8 o'clock. At that time, Bill will be walking to the studio. Joe will start his introduction at 8.01, and Bill will get here at 8.02. Joe will meet him at the door. Camera 4 will be there. Then he'll take him to that sofa. It'll be on camera 3. Bill will be sitting there during the whole program. For most of the show, Joe will be sitting next to the sofa or standing on that X. He'll be on camera too. The guests will come through that door, talk to Bill and Joe, and then go backstage. Now, is that clear? Yes, but, uh, there is one thing. Well, what is it? Where will the guests be waiting before they come on? The green room, 401. Stephanie will be sitting there with them. They'll be watching the show on a monitor. She'll cue them two minutes before they come on. Okay, I think that covers everything. Unit 3 this is your life. Good evening and
and welcome to This Is Your Life. I'm your host, Joe Campanero. We're waiting for the subject of tonight's program. He's one of the world's leading actors, and he thinks he's coming here for a talk show. I think I hear him now. Yes, here he is. William Payne, this is your life. Oh, no, I can't believe it. Not me. Yes, you. Come in with me now. Ladies and gentlemen, William Payne. Sit right over here, Bill. Let's begin at the beginning. You were born in Providence, Rhode Island on July 2nd, 1958. You were the youngest of six children. Your mother was a model, and your father worked at a furniture store. Of course, your name was Herman Wartsky then. Do you recognize this voice? I remember Herm, uh, Bill, when he was two. He used to cry and scream all day. Roseanne! All the way from Tokyo, we flew her here to be with you tonight, your sister, Roseanne Wartsky Tatsukawa. Rosie, why didn't you tell me? Yes, you haven't seen each other for nine years. Take a seat next to him, Roseanne. You went to school in Providence and got your diploma from Whitney High School in 1976. Do you remember this voice? Herman, stop daydreaming. I asked you a question. Incredible. It's Mr. Thiessen. Your English teacher, Mr. Irwin Thiessen. Was Bill a good student, Mr. Thiessen? Well, not really. No, he was the worst in the class, but he was a great actor even in those days. He could imitate all the teachers. Thank you, Mr. Thiessen. You can talk to Bill later. Well, Bill, you went on to the Yale School of Drama in 1978 and finished in 1982. In 1983, you went to Hollywood. Do you know this voice? Say, Bill, can you ride a horse yet? Rita! Yes, Rita Colon, who's flown in from New York, where she's appearing in the new musical, The Romance Dance. Bill, darling, it's so wonderful to see you. Hello, Joe, darling. Bill and I were in a movie together in 1984. Bill had to learn to ride a horse, and, well, Bill doesn't like horses very much. Like them? I'm scared to death of them. Anyway, poor Bill practiced for two weeks. Then he went to the director, it was John Galveston, and said, What do you want me to do? John said, I want you to fall off the horse. Oh, Bill was furious. He said, What? Fall off? I've been practicing for two weeks. I could fall off the first day without any practice. <laughs> Unit 4, The Louisville Rally. The Louisville Rally, which started in 1991, is quickly becoming one of the most famous car events in the United States. Competitors leave from several points around North America and follow routes of approximately equal length to a rallying point, which will be Kansas City this year. Then they follow a single route to the finish. The rally consists of six daily stages, beginning on Sunday morning, and each competitor will have driven over 2,000 miles by Friday night. It is not a race. The winner is decided on a points system. Drivers have to maintain an average speed between control points, and there are also special tests of driving skill in different conditions on the way. Rally News from CSN, Cable Sports Network. Now here's a report from Bob Costello. 
Hello from Billings, Montana. It's 9 o'clock on Monday night, September 25th, and the Pacific Northwest competitors in the Louisville Rally have just arrived here at the end of the second stage in this year's contest. Eric Rogers, who's driving a Pontiac Grand Am, is in the lead. Chris Sullivan, who won last year's rally, crashed near Spokane, Washington this morning. Chris was not hurt, but he will be unable to continue. Seven other drivers have withdrawn due to bad weather conditions. Tonight, the drivers who left from Seattle on Sunday morning will be heading into Wyoming. Unit 5, The Romance Connection. Welcome to the Romance Connection, where old-fashioned romance meets modern technology. Now here's your host, Joel Price. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our first guest tonight is Roxanne Matthews. Roxanne is a financial analyst. She likes skiing, snorkeling, and eating in good restaurants. Roxanne has been to all the four-star restaurants in the area. She loves going to the theater and the movies. She dates about once every two weeks. But she's tired of dating men who won't make a commitment. Hello, Roxanne. Hi, Joel. It's nice to be here. Now let's see the tapes that Roxanne saw. And then you'll get a chance to vote on who she should go out with. First, there was Mike. Hi, Roxanne. Let me tell you a little about myself. I really enjoy cooking, and I'd love to have someone to cook for. I started painting a few months ago, watercolors of sunsets at the beach, and I'm really pretty good, if I must say so myself. I like playing tennis, going skiing, and going hiking. I'm quite an athlete, really. I'm not interested in rock climbing or skydiving. I'm scared of falling, but I don't mind falling in love. Well, Mike sounds like quite a romantic. Next, there was George. Good evening, Roxanne. I enjoy getting dressed up and going out on the town. Dinner in fine restaurants, the theater or concerts, dancing. I'm always trying new places. I get bored going to the same restaurants all the time. I also like driving fast cars and listening to my favorite CDs while I drive. I'd love having someone in the passenger seat sharing the experience with me. Well, what do you think of that, Roxanne? And finally, there was Tim. Hi, Roxanne. I love traveling to faraway places and seeing new sights. I've recently come back from a trip to the pyramids in Egypt. They're amazing. They make you believe that anything's possible. Now I'm interested in learning more about the ancient Egyptians. I enjoy eating great ethnic food and meeting people from other cultures. I gave up traveling with other people because no one I knew had my sense of adventure. But I'm not giving up looking for someone. Well, there you have the three candidates for Roxanne. Now, audience, which one do you think Roxanne should go out with? Mike, George, or Tim? Unit 7, Battle of Sheridan Street. Channel 7 News Desk. We have two reports tonight on that continuing story from Sheridan Street. First, let's go to reporter Alan Nelson at City Hall. Report 1. Thanks, Katie. 
Well, right now, the City Housing Authority isn't working on anything except the Battle of Sheridan Street. It's one woman and her pets versus City Hall. And so far, she's winning. Ms. Hilda Martinez, the director of the Housing Authority, has agreed to talk with us. Ms. Martinez, has the situation changed since yesterday? No, Alan, it hasn't. Mrs. Hamilton is still in her house, and she still refuses to talk to us. What are you going to do? It's a difficult situation. We'd like her to come out peacefully. The police don't intend to arrest her, but she's a very stubborn woman. Stubborn? Well, it is her home. Uh, yes, and it's been her home for a long time, I know. But nobody else refused to move. You see, we're going to build 400 apartments in that area. We expect to have about 1,200 people living there when the project is finished. You have to balance that against one person and a pack of dogs. But Mrs. Hamilton was born in that house, and she is trying to give a home to the homeless dogs of this city. Of course. But we have promised to relocate her and one of her dogs to a modern apartment in a senior citizen's project. The other dogs will go to the ASPCA. So, what happens next? We can't wait forever. We want the ASPCA to take all the dogs first. Then we hope to talk to Mrs. Hamilton and convince her to move. We have to do something soon. Thank you, Miss Martinez. Live from City Hall, this has been Alan Nelson for Channel 7 News Desk. And now to Cindy Wong, who is with Mrs. Florence Hamilton at her home on Sheridan Street. Unit 9, Marriage Counseling. Jonathan and Barbara Wiener have been married for nearly 15 years. They have two children, Gary, aged 11, and Debbie, 9. During the last couple of years, Jonathan and Barbara haven't been very happy. They argue all the time. Barbara's sister advised them to go to a marriage counselor. A marriage counselor helps married couples to talk about their problems and to solve them if possible. Sometimes Jonathan and Barbara meet with the counselor separately, and other times they meet with her together. This is Jonathan and Barbara's third session with Dr. Joyce Sisters, the counselor. Oh, come in, Barbara. Have a seat. Didn't Jonathan come? Yes, he's waiting outside. He didn't want to come this week, but, well, I persuaded him to come. I see. How have things been going? Oh, about the same. We still seem to have fights all the time. What do you fight about? What don't we fight about, you mean? We fight about everything. He's so inconsiderate. How so? Well, I'll give you an example. You know, when the children started school, I wanted to go back to teaching again, so I got a job. Well, anyway, by the time I've picked Gary and Debbie up at my sister's house, she picks them up at school, I only get home about half an hour before Jonathan. Yes? Well, when he gets home, he expects me to run around and get dinner on the table. He never does anything in the house. Hmm. And last Friday, he invited three of his friends to come over for a drink. He didn't tell me to expect them. I don't think that's right, do you? Barbara, I'm not here to pass judgment. I'm here to listen. I'm sorry. And he's so messy. He's worse than the kids. I always have to remind him to pick up his clothes. He just throws them on the floor. After all, I'm not his mother, and I have my own career. Actually, I think that's part of the trouble. You see, I make more money than he does. Unit 10, At Home with the Baldwins. The Baldwin family is like many contemporary American families. Both parents work. Evan is a lawyer. Lynn is a photographer. 
Zach, 12, is in 7th grade, and Chloe, 8, is in 4th grade. 7.30 a.m. Zachary, are you ready for breakfast? No, Dad. I have to make my bed first. Okay, but hurry up. Mom's making hot cereal. By the way, what do you want for lunch today? Can I have turkey? I'm tired of tuna. No problem. Mom, I can't find my red sweater, and I want to wear it today. I think it's in the hamper. I'm going to do the laundry later so you can wear it tomorrow. Can I make a suggestion? Why don't you wear your pink sweater today? Oh, all right. Can you do my hair now? In a minute. I have to get Zach. His breakfast is getting cold. Is Daddy making dinner tonight? Uh-huh. Can we have spaghetti and meatballs? Okay. I have to make a shopping list. I'm going to do the shopping on my way home. Would you check to see if we have any spaghetti, please? 7.30 p.m. Zachary, have you done your homework yet? Yeah, Mom. I did it right after karate class. Great. Let me look at it. Here, Mom. Here's my homework. You did a good job, Zach. Did you have to do anything else? Uh... I also had to do some reading in my history book, and I had to do a crossword puzzle for science. It was easy, though. You're sure you didn't make any mistakes? Yep, I'm positive. Hey, Chloe, what are you doing? I'm making a picture for the story I wrote in school today. Oh, yeah? Terrific. Can I see it? Oh, it's very pretty. I like the colors. Thanks, Dad. Chloe, go look in the kitchen. Is Mom making coffee? Uh, no, Daddy. She's doing the dishes. Oh, I guess I can wait a few minutes. I have to make a call. Are you calling Grandma? No, it's a business call. I told someone I'd call him before 8 o'clock tonight. I hate to do business from home, but he's a special case. Unit 80. Departures. Unit, Unit 11. Unit 11, sounding polite, polite requests. Mike? Yeah? Close the door, will you? It's freezing in here. Sure. I'm sorry. Karen? Mm hmm? Lend me 50 cents. I left my purse in the office. Oh, okay. Here. Thanks. Excuse me. Could you pass the sugar? Of course. There you are. Thank you very much. Do you need some help? Oh, thank you. Would you mind putting my suitcase up on the rack? Not at all. There you go. Oh, thank you so much. You're very kind. Excuse me, it's stuffy in here. Do you mind if I open the window? No, I don't mind at all. I'd like some fresh air, too. Excuse me, Lorraine. Could I ask you something? Sure, Wendy. What is it? And can I have the day off next Friday? Well, we're very busy now. Is it important? Yeah, it is, really. It's my cousin's wedding. Oh, well, of course you can. Can I help you, ma'am? I beg your pardon? Can I help you, ma'am? Oh, uh, no, no thanks. I'm just looking. Good morning. Good morning. I wonder if you can help me. 
I'm looking for a Father's Day present for my father. Have you thought about a nice tie? Hmm, maybe. Could you show me some of your ties? Excuse me? Yes? I wonder if you'd mind handing me one of those cans of peas on the top shelf. I can't reach it. Oh, sure. There you are. Thank you very much. Unit 12, a trip to Los Angeles. James Hall has a new job with Lemon Computers in Philadelphia. He's 22 and just out of college. As part of his training, he has to spend six weeks at company headquarters near Los Angeles. It's his first business trip, and he's packing his suitcase. He lives with his parents, and his mother is helping him. Jimmy, haven't you finished packing yet? No, Mom, but it's all right. There isn't much to do. Well, I'll give you a hand. Oh, there isn't much room left. Is there anywhere to put your shaving kit? Yeah, sure. It'll go in here. Now, I have three more shirts to pack. They'll go on top, but there's another pair of shoes to get in. Put them here, one on each side. There. Okay, I think we can close it now. Okay. Where's the tag? What tag, hon? The name tag that the airline gave me to put on the suitcase. Oh, here it is. Now, do you have the key? What key? The key to lock the suitcase, of course. It's in the lock, Mom. There's nothing to worry about. There's plenty of time. Have you forgotten anything? I hope not. And you have a safe pocket for your traveler's checks? Yes, they're in my inside coat pocket. Do you have a book to read on the plane? Yes, it's in my briefcase. What about small change to make phone calls? Check. I have a pocket full of coins. Is there someone to meet you in Los Angeles? No, Mom. I'll rent a car and go to a hotel near the office. They suggested the Hollywood Inn. Do you have a reservation? I hope so. I asked them to make it. The hotel reservation, I mean. I reserved the car myself. Well, take care of yourself and be good. Call us tonight. Thanks, Mom. I will. Oh, I nearly forgot. Here's some gum to chew on the plane. You know, when it's coming down. No, Mom. Don't worry. I'll be all right. I'll see you next month. Unit 13. Flying to Los Angeles. Beverages on the plane. Something to drink, sir? Yeah, uh, yes, thanks. I'd like some club soda. With lime or without? With lime, please. Uh, how much is that? It's complimentary. The soft drinks are free. Great. Uh, will you be serving dinner soon? Sure. As soon as we finish the beverage service. Oh, good. What is it? We have a choice today of lasagna or chicken. Thanks. Uh, would you mind giving me some more peanuts? I'm getting kind of hungry. Not at all, sir. Here you go. In-flight questionnaire. Excuse me, sir. Would you mind filling out this questionnaire? What's it about? It's a survey. Okay, I'll fill it out. Auto rental. May I help you? Yes. I have a reservation. My name is James Hall. My confirmation number is 
two one seven five zero eight 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 two one. Just a moment, sir. Ah, uh, yes, I have it. Okay, I just need some information. That's Hall James. Address four twenty seven Longwood Avenue, Philadelphia, PA one nine one one nine. Are you here for business or for pleasure? Business. Um, I'm supposed to get the corporate discount. Oh yes, I see it here. And how long will you need the car? One week. All right. May I see your driver's license and a major credit card? Uh, just a moment. Oh no! I left my driver's license in Philadelphia. Unit 16. Inside Story. ABN Evening News. Young Billy Simpson's ordeal ended abruptly when the two kidnappers returned the boy safely to the Simpson home earlier today. Police Commissioner Ben Hawkins has spoken to the boy and the two kidnappers. We're waiting for the commissioner to arrive to begin his press conference. Ah, here he is now. Uh, just a few questions, please. Good evening. As you know, the Simpson boy was returned safe and sound at 2 o'clock this afternoon. The kidnappers are planning to force Mr. Simpson to pay $10 million in ransom for the boy's safe return. How exactly did they kidnap Billy? Cobb and Ahern managed to tunnel under a security fence and found Billy fishing alone at the pond. They forced Billy to go with them through the tunnel. Then they made him get into their car and lie down on the back seat. They took him to a remote, wooded area. They made the boy believe that there were wild animals in the area and that he should stay with them to be safe. That's how they forced him to stay with them. Did they harm Billy? No. After the first hour at the camp, they let him walk about freely. They were sure that he wouldn't go far. He was too scared. In fact, they made him collect wood for a fire, and he had a great time. That's when he accidentally hit Cobb in the head with a log. Is that why Cobb looks so terrible? Well, in part... Billy also got Ahern to go berry picking with him. Ahern didn't realize he was walking through poison ivy. That's why Ahern's got all those rashes on him. Why didn't Billy get rashes? He's not affected by poison ivy, but Ahern certainly is. What else happened to Cobb and Ahern? Well, this morning, Ahern and Cobb allowed Billy to play near the campsite. Billy wanted to play Tarzan, so he climbed a tree but he was afraid to climb down. He made Ahern climb up to help him, but Ahern fell off and nearly broke his leg. In his hurry to help his buddy, Cobb tripped over a rock and landed in the campfire. He got burns over 20% of his body. In the meantime, Billy got down from the tree by himself. That's when Ahern and Cobb decided to give up. They drove Billy back to the estate and asked the Simpsons to get the medical attention. Unit 17. Preferences. What are you doing tomorrow night? Nothing. Why? Well, do you like music? Yes, I do. Very much. Which do you like better, country or jazz? I like both, as a matter of fact. Well, Joed Davis is playing at the Hoot and Holler. Would you like to go? Yeah, great. He's one of my favorites. Hey, Carla, look. They have a fabulous selection of jeans. Oh, yeah. And they have my size. Yeah, but only in BCs and guest. Yeah. Hmm. I don't like either one of them very much. I really wanted some rustlers. But they don't have them in your size. Try a pair of BCs. No, I'd rather find some rustlers somewhere else. 
Well, what movie do you want to see? A Moment of Peace is at the MCM, too. I'd like to see that. I'd rather not. Let's see All's Fair. Oh, no. The reviews were terrible. But it sounds like fun. A Moment of Peace is in French. And I really don't want to read subtitles. Then how about California Sunset? I'd rather not. I can't stand Steve Newman. Well, you choose then. You know... I'd much rather stay home and rent a video. Unit 18, Earth Day. Today is Earth Day, and we're here in Central Park for the big cleanup and celebration. We asked some of the people who turned out today what they think we ought to do to help the environment. Well, I think we'd better do something to protect the tropical rainforest before they're all gone. You know, rainforests only make up like 2% of the Earth's surface, but over half the world's wild plant, animal, and insect species live there. One out of every four pharmaceuticals comes from a plant in a tropical rainforest. We ought to support organizations involved in rainforest conservation, like the Rainforest Action Network in San Francisco. The most important thing to me is to save and care for all the wildlife in the world. Did you know that by the year 2000, 20% of all Earth species could be lost forever? And we'd better not save only the mammals. We ought to be concerned about the insects, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and plants. I think the governments of the world had better get together and do something. I'm really worried about the quality of the air we breathe. Cars cause a lot of the air pollution, and everybody ought to do whatever possible to stop it, you know. For example, people ought to drive together or use public transportation. That would keep millions of pounds of pollution out of the atmosphere. People ought to buy cars that get good gas mileage and keep them tuned up and running well. The more gas a car uses, the more pollution it emits. We'd all better support the development and use of cars that use alternative energy sources, like electric cars, solar-powered cars, and cars that run on methane gas. We better not take the water we have for granted in this country. Every day we consume 450 billion gallons of water. We get this water from our rivers, lakes, and streams, or from groundwater. And we have been careless about how we've treated our water sources. We ought to take better care of the groundwater and keep it safe from pollutants, especially chemicals that people pour down their drains without thinking, or gasoline leaks from underground storage tanks. We'd also better start conserving water. Unit 19 Night Flight This is your captain, John Cook speaking. We've reached our cruising altitude and I've just turned off the fasten seatbelt sign. Our estimated time of arrival in Anchorage is 1 a.m., so we've got a long flight ahead of us. I hope you enjoy it. Our flight attendants will be serving dinner shortly. Thank you. It was Christmas Eve, 1959. A lot of the passengers on the nearly full plane were traveling home to spend the holidays with their families. It was a smooth and quiet flight. The flight attendants had just finished picking up the trays and were in the galley putting things away when the first buzzers sounded. One of the flight attendants went down the aisle to check. 
When she came back, she looked surprised. It's amazing, she said. Even on a smooth flight like this, two people have gotten sick. Twenty minutes later, nearly half the passengers were sick, violently sick. Several were moaning and groaning. Some were doubled up in pain, and two were unconscious. Fortunately, there was a doctor on board, and he was helping the flight attendants. He came to the galley and said, "I'd better speak to the pilot. This is a severe case of food poisoning." I think we'd better land as soon as possible. What caused it? Asked one of the flight attendants. Well, replied the doctor, I had the beef for dinner and I'm fine. The passengers who chose the fish are sick. The flight attendant led him to the cockpit. The door was jammed. Together they pushed it open. The captain was lying unconscious behind the door. The co-pilot was slumped across the controls, and the engineer was trying to revive him. The doctor quickly examined the two men. "Can you land the plane?" the doctor asked the engineer. "Me? No, I'm not a pilot. We've got to revive them," he replied. The plane's on automatic pilot. We're okay for a couple of hours. They could be out for a long time," said the doctor. "I'd better contact ground control," said the engineer. "Maybe you should make an announcement and try to find out if there's a pilot on board," the doctor suggested. "We can't do that," the flight attendant said. "It'll cause a general panic." Suddenly, she remembered something. One of the passengers, I overheard him saying that he'd been a pilot. I'll get him. She found the man and asked him to come to the galley. Didn't you say you used to be a pilot? She asked. Yes. Why? She led him to the cockpit. They explained the situation to him. You mean you want me to fly the plane? He asked. You must be joking. I was a pilot, but I flew single-engined fighter planes, and that was 15 years ago. This thing's got four engines. Isn't there anybody else? He asked. I'm afraid not," said the flight attendant. The man sat down at the controls. His hands were shaking slightly. The engineer connected him to air traffic control. They told him to keep flying on automatic pilot toward Anchorage, and wait for further instructions from an experienced pilot. An hour later, the lights of Anchorage appeared on the horizon. He could see the lights of the runway shining brightly by a lake. Air traffic control. Told him to keep circling until the fuel gauge registered almost empty. This gave him a chance to get used to handling the controls. Unit Twenty, the Antique Store. Anita Jamison and Steve Weaver are antique dealers. They have a very successful business. They travel around the country buying antique furniture and paintings from flea markets, antique stores, and elderly people. Steve has just come out of a little antique store, and he seems very excited. Anita, we're in luck. There's a painting in there, a landscape. It's a good one. I thought it might be valuable, so I took a good look at the signature. It isn't very clear, but I think it may be a Winslow Homer. A Winslow Homer? It can't be. They're all in museums. 
They're worth a fortune. Well, someone found one a couple of years ago. This might be another one. It's dirty and it isn't in very good condition. How much do you think it's worth? I don't know. Maybe a million. It might even be worth more. Be careful, Steve. We'd better use the old trick. Yeah, right. There's a chair in the window. It must be worth about twenty dollars. I'll offer a hundred bucks for it. She'll be so happy that she won't think about the painting. Don't say you want the painting. Say you want the frame, okay? Fine. You'd better wait in the van. I'd rather do this on my own. Ah,、uh, Steve, check the signature before you give her a hundred bucks for the chair. Don't worry, Anita. I know what I'm doing. I'll be with you in a minute. I'm interested in that chair in the window. What? That old thing? It's been there for years. It has. Um, it's very nice. I think it could be Victorian. Really? Yes, I think I'm right. I've seen one or two other chairs like it. I think I could get a good price for that in New York. I'll offer you a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? You must be out of your mind. No, no, it's a fair price. Well then, it's yours. There you are then, a hundred dollars. Goodbye. Oh, by the way, that painting's in a nice frame. It's a nice picture, honey. Late nineteenth century, I- I've heard. Oh no, no, it can't be. I've seen lots like it. It must be twentieth century. There's no market for them. Still, I could use the frame. All right. How much will you give me for it? Uh, how about forty dollars? Oh no, honey. It must be worth more than that. It came from the big house on the hill. It did. Let me have another look at it. Yes, the frame really is nice. I'll give you two hundred dollars. Oh my! I don't know what to do. You see, I like that painting myself. All right, two hundred and fifty. That's my final offer. Let's say two seventy-five. Okay, it's a deal. Should I wrap it up for you? No, no. I have the van outside. It was nice doing business with you. Goodbye. Bye, bye, honey. Thank you. You come back to see us. You hear? Beauregard. Yes, darling. I've sold another one of your imitation Winslow Homers. You'd better bring another one downstairs if the paint's dry. The young gentleman who bought it seemed very happy with it. Unit Twenty One: Noisy Neighbors. Ozzy, wake up! Huh? What? What's the matter? It can't be seven o'clock already. No, it's one thirty. It's those people next door again. Listen. Oh yeah, they must be having another party. They must be waking up a whole block. And they have three young children. Those kids couldn't be sleeping through that racket. It's disgusting. Somebody should call the police. They're all laughing. They must be having a good time. They never invite us, do they? Ozzy. Yes, dear. What is it now? Listen. They must be leaving. At last. 
Maybe we'll get some sleep. I hope so. It's nearly three o'clock. Good night, dear. No, oh, no, now they're having a fight. That figures. They always have fights after parties. Uh-oh, they must be throwing the dishes again. No, I think that was a vase, dear. Well, maybe the TV set. Or both. Ozzy, listen. There's someone in the backyard next door. Huh? It must be a cat. No, it can't be. It's too loud. What time is it? It's a quarter to five. Who could it be? I'd better take a look. Ooh, it's Howard, and he's carrying a shovel. Really? You don't think he's killed her, do you? Well, we haven't heard her voice for a while. No, she's probably sleeping. But what could he be doing at this time of the morning? If he has killed her, he might be burying the body. What? You don't think so, do you? He couldn't be planting tomatoes, could he? I'm going to ask him what he's doing. Hello there, Howard. You're up bright and early this morning. I haven't been to bed yet. We had a party last night. I hope we didn't keep you awake. Oh, no, no. We didn't hear a thing. Nothing at all. I slept like a log. Well, it was a pretty noisy party. My wife knocked over the kid's hamster cage while we were cleaning up. The poor hamster died. I'm just burying him before the kids wake up. Unit 22, A Sparkling Camp. It's Friday afternoon in June at the Takabachi Summer Camp. The camp counselors are supposed to be working, but they aren't. The camp has to be ready for the first summer campers. They'll arrive tomorrow. The counselors have had lunch, and they're taking it easy in the counselors' lounge. Their camp director has just opened the door. He's brought the duty roster with him, so he knows exactly what each of them should be doing. Hey! What's going on here? Terry, what are you doing? I'm watching TV. And what are you supposed to be doing? I'm not sure. Well, let me tell you, Terry. You're supposed to be cutting the grass. Oh, right. I'm sorry. I'll get right on it. When I come back, you'd better be cutting the grass. Do you hear me? Okay, okay. I'm going. Get a move on, Terry. Remember the Takabachi motto, a sparkling camp by the sparkling water. A funny thing happened to me last Friday. I'd gone into New York to do some holiday shopping. I wanted to get some presents and I wanted to see the city all decorated for the holidays. You know, the store windows and the big tree at Rockefeller Center. I had gotten into the city early, so by early afternoon I'd bought everything I wanted. Anyway, I was really tired. All that shopping in crowded stores. And I'd made plans for that night. I just wanted to get home so I could relax before I had to go out again. I went to the Long Island Railroad at Penn Station. It was well before rush hour. I had apparently just missed a train, and the next one wouldn't be leaving for 40 minutes, so I decided I had time for a cup of coffee. I bought a Times and went into a small donut shop and sat at the counter. I ordered a cup of coffee and a box of a half dozen assorted mini donuts. I figured I would eat a couple and take the rest home for my family. Anyway, they were having a special on the mini donuts, and I can't resist a bargain. I started the crossword puzzle in the paper. A few minutes later, a woman sat down next to me on the stool to my left. That surprised me because there were several empty stools. There was nothing strange about her except that she was very tall. 
In fact, she looked like a typical businesswoman. You know, conservative suit, briefcase. I didn't say anything. I just kept doing the crossword. Suddenly, she reached out, opened the box of donuts, took one out, dunked it in her coffee, and began to eat it. I couldn't believe my eyes. Anyway, I didn't want to make a scene, so I decided to ignore it. I always avoid trouble if I can. I just took a donut myself and went back to my crossword. When the woman took a second donut, I didn't say a word. After all, if I hadn't protested when she took the first one, how could I say anything when she took the second one? I pretended to be very interested in the puzzle. A few minutes later, I casually put out my hand, took another donut, and glanced at the woman. She seemed to be glaring at me. She was making me feel so nervous that I decided to have a third donut. That left only one, for only a minute. Sure enough, the woman took the last donut. I nervously continued eating my donut and decided to leave. I was ready to get up and go when the woman suddenly stood up and hurried out of the donut shop. I felt very relieved and decided to wait for two or three minutes before going myself. I finished my second cup of coffee, folded my newspaper and stood up. And there, on the counter, underneath where my paper had been, was my unopened box of donuts. Unit 24, Murder in New Orleans. Charles Beresford Tifton was found dead on the floor of his study in the Tifton family mansion in New Orleans. He had been shot five times. There were five people on the estate and they all heard the shots at about 4 p.m. The police have taken statements and made the following notes about each of the five people. Lydia Tifton's statement. I was reading in my bedroom on the first floor. I heard the shots. There were four or five. I wheeled myself into the hall. The study door was open. Ruth Ellen was standing in the doorway screaming. Ah! Benson was standing at the French windows. The gun was on the floor next to my husband's body. J.D.'s statement. I was in the den. I was listening to a new CD. Uh, suddenly there were five shots. I thought it was Uncle Ike at target practice. Then I heard a scream. It sounded like Ruth Allen, so I opened the connecting door to the study and saw Big Daddy lying there, bent in at the French windows, and Mama and Ruth Allen together in the doorway to the hall. I couldn't believe my eyes. Ruth Ellen Potts statement. I was in the living room writing my resume, I heard the shots and ran across the hall. The door to the study was open. There was poor dear Charles, Mr. Tifton, lying in a pool of blood. I started screaming. Benson came in through the French windows. They were open. Then Mrs. Tifton arrived. She didn't say a word. She just stared at me. Benson's statement. I was about to take my afternoon walk. The doctor told me to walk twice a day for my heart. Anyway, I had just come out of the back door, and I was walking around the corner of the house when I heard shooting. I ran across the lawn to the French windows. I saw Mr. Charles's body and Miss Ruth Allen in the doorway. Unit 25, Murder in New Orleans.
Chief of Detectives Tony D'Amato is in charge of the case. Detective Sergeant Novak is his assistant. They're in the Tifton study. Where is everybody? They're all in the living room. Reyes is with them. What do you think? It could have been any of them, couldn't it? Nobody seems very sad. Might have even been all of them. Yeah. Tifton wasn't exactly popular around here. Nobody liked him. But it could have been an outsider. No way. It must have been one of them. Let's look at the evidence. It seems to me that everybody has a motive and nobody has an alibi. They all say they were alone when it happened. Yes, and there are no fingerprints on the gun. Lydia Tifton? It couldn't have been her. Why not? Well, she's in a wheelchair. She can't move very fast. Anyway, they've been married for 35 years. It just couldn't have been her. Most murders are committed by someone in the family, and that door goes into her room. Right, but it was locked. Doors have keys. But why would she want to kill him? Ruth Ellen Potts is a very attractive young woman. We don't know what was going on. She might have been jealous. But he was over 60. He was old enough to be Potts' grandfather. Hmm, yes. But he was a good-looking man and very rich and powerful. Dwight Dubois? What about Dubois, Novak? He's a weird guy. I've been thinking about that. It couldn't have been him. Why not? Why would he need to shoot five times? He was a champion marksman. He could have killed him with one shot. Maybe he did, Novak. Maybe he did. I don't follow. There are a lot of things you don't follow, Novak. Maybe he's smarter than he looks. But there's no motive. There might have been. I mean, there was the scandal with that land development company. But he was down by the pond. So? He could have shot him from the trees and thrown the gun into the room. Oh, yeah. Do you really think so? I don't know. It's just a theory. Unit 26. Call him. You're on the air. Good evening, I'm Harry Baxter, and this is Call In on radio station WLFM. We're talking tonight about government services. Do you think you're getting what you've paid for? What's your opinion? Call in. We'd like to hear from you. The number is 555-1785. Call in. You're on the air. Hi, Harry. My name is Stuart Amos. I'm a salesman and I have to drive a lot. Why is it that there's always construction going on on all the alternate routes at exactly the same time? I mean, I understand that the roads need to be maintained, but there's absolutely no coordination. Like, when they're fixing one bridge into the city, why do they have to fix the other bridge at the same time? It's ridiculous. Good point, Stuart. Let's hope the Department of Transportation folks are listening. Call in. You're on the air. Good evening, Harry. I'm Hilda Diaz. Why are they closing the fire station in my neighborhood? We need it to stay open. I heard that the um, response time is going to be increased by 10 minutes if that fire station closes. 10 minutes. That could mean the difference between life and death, you know. If they're trying to save money, why don't those politicians all take a pay cut? That's where the waste is, if you ask me. Well, Hilda, you certainly sound passionate. We'll see if the city doesn't change its mind. I hope you've called your city council representative. Call in. You're on the air. Harry? I'm Milton Kramer. 
I'm fed up with those sanitation trucks that come in the middle of the night and make all that noise. They must start at around 4 o'clock in the morning, and it's every other night. I'm sound asleep, and I have about three more hours before the alarm's going to go off, and the garbage truck comes. I can never get back to sleep, and before I know it, I have to get up for work. It ruins my whole day. There must be a way for them to change the schedule so they don't wake up the neighborhood. You know, Milton, I've never understood why sanitation trucks have to come in the middle of the night either. I'm sure the sanitation workers wouldn't mind having different hours, say, like 7 o'clock to 4 o'clock. <laughs> and on that note, it's time to say goodnight. Thank you for listening, and remember to tune in again tomorrow. Unit 27, making a complaint. Good morning. I'd like to speak to the manager. I am the manager, sir. How can I help you? Well, it's this radio. It doesn't work. Hmm. Did you buy it here? What? Of course I bought it here. Look, you turn it on and nothing happens. May I see your receipt? Receipt? Uh, I don't have one. You must have gotten a receipt when you bought it. I probably did. I must have thrown it away. Uh-huh. Well, do you have any other proof of purchase? The guarantee, for example? No. It must have been in the box. I threw that away, too. That's too bad. You really ought to have kept it. We need to know the exact date of purchase. What? I only bought it yesterday. That young man over there waited on me. Oh, I paid by credit card. I have my copy here. Oh, all right, then. Did you test the radio before you left the store? Test it? No, it was in the original box. I expected it to work. It wasn't some cheap radio. It's a good brand. You should have tested it. Come on, stop telling me what I should have done and do something. Either give me my money back or give me another radio. There's no need to get impatient, sir. Let me look at it. Hmm. You see this little switch in the back? Yes. It's on AC, and it should be on DC. You really should have read the instructions. Oh. Unit 28. The Mary Celeste. The Mary Celeste was built in 1861 in Nova Scotia, Canada, as a cargo-carrying sailing ship. When it was launched, it was given the name Amazon. It was not a lucky ship. The first captain died a few days after it was registered, and on its first voyage in 1862, it was badly damaged in a collision. While it was being repaired in port, it caught fire. In 1863, it crossed the Atlantic for the first time, and in the English Channel, it collided with another ship that sank. The Amazon was badly damaged itself. In 1867, it ran aground on Cape Breton Island off the Canadian coast and had to be rebuilt. It was then sold, and the name was changed to the Mary Celeste. Sailors are very superstitious and dislike sailing on ships which have been unlucky or which have changed their names. Many sailors refuse to sail on the Mary Celeste. On November 5, 1872, the Mary Celeste left New York, carrying a cargo of industrial alcohol to Genoa in Italy.
There were eleven people on board. Captain Briggs, an experienced captain, his wife and two-year-old daughter, and a crew of eight. A month later, the Mary Celeste was seen by another ship, the De Gratia, about halfway between the Azores and the Portuguese coast. Captain Morehouse of the De Gratia, a friend of Captain Briggs, noticed that the ship was sailing strangely. When the Mary Celeste did not answer his signal, he sent a small boat to find out what was wrong. The Mary Celeste was completely deserted. The only lifeboat was missing. All the sails were up and in good condition. All the cargo was there. The ship had obviously been through storms. The glass cover on the compass was broken. The windows of the deck cabins had been covered with wooden planks. There was three feet of water in the cargo hold, which was not enough to be dangerous. The water pumps were working perfectly. There was enough food for six months and plenty of fresh water. All the crew's personal possessions—clothes, boots, pipes and tobacco, etc.—were on board. There were toys on the captain's bed. There was food and drink on the cabin table. Only the navigation instruments and ship's papers were missing. The last entry in the ship's logbook had been made eleven days earlier, about six hundred miles west, but the ship had continued in a straight line from there. The forehatch was found open. There were two deep marks on the bow near the waterline. There was a deep cut on the ship's rail, made by an axe. There were old brown blood stains on the deck and on the captain's sword, which was in the cabin. Captain Morehouse and his crew were given the salvage money for bringing the ship to port. There was a long official investigation, but the story of what had happened on the ship and what had happened to the crew still remains a mystery. Unit Twenty Nine. What do you think happened? I don't know what happened, but it must have happened suddenly. Why do you think that? Think about it. There were toys on the captain's bed, weren't there? The kid must have been playing, and they must have interrupted her suddenly. Yes, that's true. And food was on the table. They must have been eating or getting ready to eat. The lifeboat was missing, right? They could have been practicing their emergency drill. They must have gotten into the boat and launched it. All right, but what happened to the boat? Well, they may have been rowing the lifeboat around the ship, and there must have been a gust of wind. Then the ship could have moved forward and run down the lifeboat. That explains the marks on the bow. Come on, they couldn't have all been sitting in the lifeboat. What about the captain? He should have been steering the ship. Well, he might have been watching the drill and jumped in to save the others. Unit Thirty One. Apologies. Hello. Hi, Raphael. This is Alex. Oh hi! Did you get home all right? Yeah, thanks. But I wanted to apologize for last night. Don't worry about it. But your carpet—it must be ruined. It was so dumb of me to put my coffee on the floor. Come on, Alex. Forget it. But it must have made a really ugly stain. Look, it's nothing. 
I was upset at first, but it doesn't look so bad this morning. Anyway, I want to pay for the cleaning. Listen, Alex, it's no big deal. Accidents happen, at parties especially. Well, if you say so, but I really am sorry. Okay. See you on Monday. Bye now. Excuse me, would you mind not walking on the grass? I beg your pardon? You aren't allowed to walk on the grass. Really? I didn't see a sign. There it is, right over there. Oh, you're right. I'm terribly sorry. Oh, good morning, Marianne. Good afternoon, Sharon. Late again, I see. Yes, I'm sorry. I couldn't find a parking place. Maybe you should have left home earlier. Yes, I know. It won't happen again, Marianne. It had better not, Sharon. This is the third time this week. Hey, you. Are you talking to me? Yeah, you. What do you think you're doing? I'm just waiting for the bus. Can't you see there's a line? Oh, there is? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut. I didn't realize there was a line. Are you all right? Yes, I'm okay. But what about my car? There doesn't seem to be too much damage. Let me see. Look at that. This is a brand new car. You shouldn't have been going so fast. Well, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't your fault? What do you mean, it wasn't your fault? I have the right of way. As a matter of fact, you didn't. You shouldn't have come out like that. Why not? There's no stop sign. Then what's that? Oh, a stop sign. I must have missed it. Well, you should have been more careful. You could have gotten us all killed. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. What else can I say? Just thank goodness nobody's hurt. Here come the police. You'd better explain it to them. Unit 32, they didn't stop to tell me. Police Captain Mel Torino is questioning Nicholas Estrella, the driver of the hijacked Ruby Star truck. Let's start at the beginning again, Mr. Estrella. How did you lose your truck? I was making deliveries in Bedford. The truck was loaded with TVs, VCRs, radios, you know, electronics. Uh-huh. So you drove to Bedford from the Ruby Star Warehouse. Right. About 10 o'clock, I made a delivery on Boyle Street. I had finished, and I was driving up Boyle when I saw a coffee shop. So you decided to stop. That's right. I stopped to get a sandwich to go. Go on. It didn't take me more than three minutes. I started walking back to the truck, and... Did you see anybody near the truck? No, nobody. So anyway, I decided to make a phone call. I passed a magazine stand and I stopped to get change. Okay, then what? Well, I was talking to my wife when I saw the truck going down the street. I couldn't believe my eyes. 
I dropped the phone and ran down the street, but they were moving fast. I couldn't catch up. Did you remember to lock the cab door? Yes, I always remember to lock it. I'm not stupid. Okay, okay, take it easy. Can you actually remember locking it this time? Yes, definitely. I remember putting the key in the lock. The key was all wet and dirty. It was raining, and I dropped it in a puddle. What about the door on the other side? Did you remember to check it? I don't actually remember checking it, but it's always locked, and I never use it. But you don't remember checking it? No, not really. Maybe I forgot to check it. So, it could have been open. Yes, I guess so. But I'd bet anything it wasn't. So what's your theory? They must have had keys. They started the engine, didn't they? How did they get the keys? Don't ask me. I have no idea. They didn't stop to tell me. Unit 33, John Lennon, 1940 to 1980. John Lennon was murdered just before 11 p.m. on December 8, 1980, outside the Dakota, the apartment building where he lived in New York City. He had just gotten out of a car and was walking to the entrance when a voice called, Mr. Lennon. Lennon turned and was shot five times. The killer threw his gun down and stood there smiling. Do you know what you just did? shouted the doorman. I just shot John Lennon, the killer replied. Lennon was rushed to the hospital in a police car, but it was too late. The killer was 25-year-old Mark Chapman from Hawaii. Earlier the same evening, he had asked Lennon for his autograph. In fact, he had been hanging around outside the apartment building for several days. Chapman was a fan of Lennon's and had tried to imitate him in many ways. It is said that he even believed that he was John Lennon. Unit 34 Beach Watch Hey, look at that guy. He's way out there. You're right. Unless he turns around soon, he'll be in trouble. I'm going in. That guy needs help. Call emergency services. Oh, no. Unless the lifeguard gets there soon, that guy will drown. Unless the lifeguard brings him in fast, the guy will die. Unless she can get his heart going, he won't make it. I've got a pulse. If I were that guy, I'd give those lifeguards a reward. Unit 35. Have you seen this ad? Wanda, have you seen this ad? Yeah, it looks great, doesn't it? I called them an hour ago. They'll call back if they want me. Oh, they'll want you. You have beautiful hair. Thanks. You know I'm excited. 
I mean, if I go, I'll get a new hairstyle for nothing. Hey, Bill, look at this ad. Hmm, it looks like fun. Why don't you call them up? I'd love to, but it's a waste of time. My hair is just too short. Well, I like it the way it is. Anyway, you don't know what they might do. Oh, that wouldn't bother me. If I had longer hair, I'd call them up. Actually, your hair is pretty long now. Pablo, look at this. It sounds great. And you have a decent car. Uh, but there are some disadvantages. Every job has disadvantages. Oh, I don't know. I'm willing to try it, but I won't take it if they don't pay the phone bill. Pam, did you see this? Yeah. You aren't interested, are you? No, there are too many things wrong with it. Like what? Are you kidding? You wouldn't have any security. You wouldn't earn anything if you didn't work all day long every day. And I wouldn't take a job in sales if they didn't provide a car. Look at the address. Some hotel. I'd never work for a company if they didn't even have an office. Tina, what do you think of this ad? It was in last Sunday's paper, too. I called. I have an interview tomorrow. Do you think you'll get it? They seem very interested on the phone. I think they'll offer me the job. So you're going to France? I didn't say that. I won't take the job unless they give me a round-trip ticket. It'll be hard work, and I won't go unless they offer me a good salary. There's a job in France in the paper. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't dream of taking it. Why not? You've always wanted to work overseas. It's hard work, isn't it? One night off a week. But the money might be good. Well, I wouldn't take it unless they pay me a really good salary with a longer vacation and more free time. And I certainly wouldn't go anywhere overseas unless my ticket was round trip. Unit 36, Glacier Watch. Carmen Melvin is from Miami, Florida. She's on vacation in Alaska and she's taken a flight-seeing trip to a glacier. The helicopter has landed on the glacier. This way. Watch where you're going, please. Our insurance company doesn't want you to hurt yourselves. This is incredible. Isn't it great? Oh, watch your step and stay close by me. That is, unless you want to fall into a crevice. There are crevices hundreds of feet deep over there. We're going to begin by walking over to look at them. There's so much ice. And they keep telling us about global warming, you know, that the Earth is getting hotter. Well, I've been doing this job for five years, and the glacier has retreated. It used to be half a mile longer. Oh, really? Sure. Uh, unless it begins snowing more during the winters, it'll be gone in 50 years. What's the reason for that? We can't say. Farther north, some glaciers are still advancing. Maybe it's the local weather here in southeast Alaska, not the world climate. 
unless we do more research, we won't know. People say it's the greenhouse gases. You know, if every car carried one more passenger, the United States would use less gasoline. Well, maybe. If everyone planted one tree a year, things would improve. And if we all walked instead of driving, the air would be cleaner. And I guess we'd all be healthier. But you can't measure it, really. So, in 50 years' time, this will all be gone? Right. Unless the winters start getting colder. Colder winters? How do you feel about that here in Alaska? Aren't they cold enough for you? Sure. But I wouldn't live here unless I liked snow and ice. And tourists wouldn't come here unless there were glaciers. And believe me, we need the tourist business. Unit 37. What would you have done? The Reader's Page. What would you have done? Last week, we invited you, the readers, to write and tell us about things that had happened to you or things that you had heard about. We wanted stories where people just didn't know what to do next. Here are the stories that interested us the most. That's my coffee. Or was. I was at a counter in a restaurant in a small western town. I had just been served a cup of coffee. Suddenly, this huge man, he looked like a boxer, came over, picked up my coffee, drank it, banged the cup down on the table, stared at me, and then walked away without saying anything. I suppose I should have said something, but I was scared stiff. I didn't know what to do. What would you have done? Stanley Wempy, Carbondale, Illinois. In deep water. I was driving through Oregon on my vacation. It was a very hot day, and I stopped at a small, deserted beach. I didn't have my bathing suit with me, but it was early in the morning, and there were no people or houses in sight. So I took off my clothes and swam out in the ocean in my underwear. I'm a very strong swimmer. I floated on my back closed my eyes, and relaxed in the water. When I looked back at the beach, several cars had arrived, and there were 20 or 30 people sitting on the sand having a picnic. What would you have done? Jane Dare, Spokane, Washington. That's a no-no. I heard a great story about the Reverend Billy Cracker. He'd gone to London to speak at a large meeting. Anyway, when he stepped off the plane, there were a lot of reporters and TV cameras. The first question one of the reporters asked was, Do you intend to visit any nightclubs in London? Reverend Cracker smiled at the reporter. Are there any nightclubs in London? He answered innocently. The next morning, the headline in one of the London papers was, Cracker's first question on arrival in London, are there any nightclubs? How would you have felt? Reverend Oral Richards, Columbia, South Carolina. Strangers in the Night My story isn't funny at all. It was a very frightening experience. You see, one night I woke up suddenly. I heard the tinkle of broken glass from downstairs, and I heard the window opening. Then I heard two voices. My wife woke up, too. She told me to do something. A couple of days before, there had been a report about a burglary in the local paper. The burglars had been interrupted, and they had beaten up the homeowner.
They'd nearly killed him. I was trembling with fear. I just didn't know what to do. In the end, I didn't go down, and they stole the sterling silverware we had inherited from my mother. Was I right? What would you have done? Lorenzo Machado, Abilene, Texas Deep Fried I had parked my car at a local shopping mall, and I was taking a shortcut through the side door of a restaurant. Halfway across the restaurant, I spotted my father eating a hamburger and french fries. He often eats there. I sneaked up behind him, put my hand over his shoulder, took a french fry off the plate, dipped it in the ketchup, and ate it. Then I realized that the man was not my father. I was so embarrassed. I couldn't say a word. What would you have done? Cheryl Redburn, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Unit 38, A Bad Day at the Office. What was wrong this morning? Wrong? What do you mean? You walked straight past me. Really? Where? By that newsstand on First Street. I'm really sorry, Amy. I just didn't see you. Come on, Tim. You must have. I was waving. No, honestly, I didn't see you. If I had seen you, I would have said hello. Tim, have you sent that fax to Japan? No, I haven't. Why haven't you done it yet? It's urgent. Because you didn't ask me to do it. I didn't? No, you didn't. If you had asked me, I'd have sent it. Achoo. What's the matter, Debbie? You don't look well. No, I've had a terrible cold. It's better today, though. Hmm. I had a bad cold last week. I know, and you gave it to everyone in the office. I wouldn't have come to work if I'd had a cold like that. Tim, did you type this letter or did Akiko? I did. Is there something wrong? Take a look. This should be $400,000. You typed $40,000. Oops. I'm really sorry. And the customer's name should be Snelling, not Smelling. Oh, no. Did I put that? If I hadn't noticed it, we could have lost the order. Hi, Tim. Did you have a good day today? No, not really. I'm glad it's over. Everything went wrong. Really? Yeah. I made a lot of mistakes in typing, then I forgot to send a fax, and Amy got upset because I ignored her on the street. Why was that? If I hadn't gone to bed late, it wouldn't have been such an awful day. Unit 39, a Saturday afternoon. Laura felt slightly uneasy as the guard unlocked the gates and waved her through. The Blitzkopf Clinic was, after all, the most exclusive institution of its type in the country. She parked her car outside the main entrance of the sterile white main building. She paused on the steps to look at the beautiful flower gardens. An old man was watering the flower bed beside the steps. He smiled at her. Good afternoon. Are you a new patient? Oh, I'm not a patient. I'm just here to do some research. I wonder if you could tell me the way to Dr. Blitzkoff's office? Certainly. Just go through the main door, turn left, 
Walk down to the end of the hall, and it's the last door on the right. Thank you very much. Dr. Blitzkopf was expecting her. He had been looking forward to meeting his new research assistant. Dr. Blitzkopf showed her around. He was obviously very proud of his clinic, and Laura was impressed by the relaxed and informal atmosphere. For the next few weeks, Laura spent the mornings interviewing patients and the afternoons in the flower gardens, writing up the results of her research. Some of the patients were withdrawn and depressed. Some seemed almost normal. She found it hard to believe that all of them had been considered too dangerous to live in normal society. Laura often saw the old man in the straw hat. He spent most of his time working in the flower gardens, but he always stopped to speak to her. She found out that his name was Edward Beale. He was a gentle and mild-mannered man, with clear blue, honest eyes, white hair, and a pinkish complexion. He always looked pleased with life. She became particularly curious about him. One night at dinner, she asked about Mr. Beale. Ah,、uh, yes, Edward, nice old guy. He's been here longer than anybody. What's wrong with him? Nothing. His family put him here forty years ago. They never come to visit him, but the bills are always paid on time. But what had he done? He burned down his school when he was seventeen. Over the next few years, there were a number of mysterious fires in his neighborhood, but the family did nothing until he tried to set fire to the family mansion. He was in here the next day. Edward never protested. And that was forty years ago. I'm afraid so. But he couldn't still be dangerous. No, if he wanted to start a fire, he could have done it at any time. Laura was shocked by the story. She wrote letters to Edward's family, but never received a reply. He had never been officially certified as insane. So he could leave at any time. Doctor Blitzkopf let her talk to Edward. Edward, have you ever thought about leaving this place? No, this is my home, and anyway, I have nowhere else to go. But wouldn't you like to go into town sometimes? I suppose it would be nice. But I wouldn't want to stay away for long. I've spent forty years working on this garden. What would happen to it if I weren't here? Laura realized that it would be unkind to make him leave. But when she found out that the next Saturday was his birthday, she arranged with the staff to give him a party. They wanted it to be a surprise. And Doctor Blitzkopf agreed to let him go out for the afternoon. Edward left at two o'clock. He seemed quite excited. They expected him to return about four o'clock. The cook had made a birthday cake. Laura was standing in the window when she saw him. He was walking up the drive toward the house, whistling cheerfully. Behind him, above the trees. Thick black columns of smoke were beginning to rise slowly into the clear blue sky. Unit Forty, Vacation USA. Marisol is Colombian and married to George Merrick, an American teaching in Colombia. 
They've just returned to Colombia, and George is telling his friends at work about their trip. We had a great time, but it was pretty tiring. We went on most of the tours because Marisol didn't want to miss anything. I really felt we needed more time. If we went again, we'd stay longer. We would have spent more time in San Francisco and less time in Los Angeles if we'd had a choice. Los Angeles was a little disappointing. We went on a tour of Beverly Hills to see the Houses of the Stars, but unless you had studied film history, you would never have heard of most of them. Generally speaking, the hotels, food, and service were excellent. Marisol found Americans to be very friendly. We probably took too much luggage. Clothes in California were so cheap. It would have been a good idea to take along an empty suitcase. If I'd done that, the savings on clothes would almost have paid for half of the airfare. Well, not really. The Rizzos, a retired couple from Bangor, Maine, were on the tour with the Merricks. Florence Rizzo was asked about the trip. We'd been looking forward to this trip for years, and it was the vacation of a lifetime. I think we enjoyed Las Vegas the most, but two nights were probably enough. If we'd stayed there much longer, we'd have lost all our money. Disneyland is a must for anyone with children. If only we'd had our grandchildren with us. They would have loved it. We went on some of the tours, and we could have gone on more. But you can't see everything, can you? I love the food in California. You know, all those salads and fresh vegetables. We wouldn't have gone on this trip unless it had been an escorted tour group. We're not as young as we used to be, and we couldn't have done it on our own. Everyone, however, was so helpful to us. Unit 42, I Wish. Yes? Your call from New York's on line one. Paris has just come through on line two. And there's a call from Tokyo on line four. Ask them to call back tomorrow, Judy. Tell them... Tell them I'm not here. It's too late. I wish I wasn't here. I've had enough today. But they're urgent. All of them. Do you know something, Judy? I wish I was at home now, in front of the television with a cup of hot chocolate. Look at that. It's pouring again. And I have to walk to the bus stop. Well, at least it's not snow. It's all right for Waspson. His limousine is downstairs waiting to take him home. Yeah, I wish I had a chauffeur-driven limousine. I wish I had a car. Any car. I'm going to get soaked tonight. Hi, Jane. Still here? Yes, I'm waiting to see Waspson. You don't usually work late. I wish I wasn't working this evening. There's a good game on TV. Oh, well, maybe he'll call you in soon. <sighs> I hope he does. Haven't you left yet? No, I wish I had. I can't go until I've finished this report. Can't you do it tomorrow? I wish I could, but Waspson wants it tonight. How are you doing, Joe? Oh, hi, Shirley. I don't feel like working tonight. Neither do I. I hate this kind of work. Why do you do it, then? I wish I didn't have to, but we need the money. My husband's out of work again. I know what you mean. I wish I'd learned how to type or something like that. We can all wish. I dropped out of school at 16. I wish I hadn't. But I never got good grades, and I hated it. Kids have it really easy in school nowadays. I wish we'd had more of a chance. I'd never have ended up cleaning offices. Come on, Shirley. 
Let's try to finish early and get out of here. Look at that, Sergeant. There are still lights on in the insurance company again. Yes, it looks nice and warm, doesn't it? I sometimes wish I worked there. You do? Really? Uh-huh. Sometimes. A nice office, a desk, lots of people around. It can't be bad. And the boss's limo outside. Still, you know what they say. The grass is always greener on the other side. Oh, I suppose you're right, Sarge. Hey, that limousine is in front of a fire hydrant. Oh, yeah. Give him a parking ticket, Lucy. He can afford it. Unit 43. The happiest days of your life. Some people say that your days in school are the happiest days of your life. Here are five people talking about their experiences. Wade Hamlin is a successful self-employed builder. School? It's a waste of time, mostly. At least it was for me. I quit after my sophomore year in college because I stopped hoping that I would ever learn anything. I wanted to start earning a living in the real world. The biggest problem with school is the teachers. If I had listened to my teachers, I would know all about Shakespeare and what day the Civil War started and how to conjugate Spanish verbs and how to prove the Pythagorean theorem and all that junk. But I wouldn't know anything about how to make a business deal or raise my kids or anything that's really important. I'm sorry I went to school at all. Anne Marie Johnson is the personnel manager of a department store. I loved school. I was a straight-A student almost every year, but I didn't spend all my time studying. I participated in a lot of extracurricular activities and sports, too. I was in student government both in high school and in college. I was always sorry when summer vacation started. Three months with no school? Most kids like vacations more than school, but not me. Some of my friends in high school didn't go to college, but they regret it now. Some of them would have done well if they had been encouraged to go. I only regret not going to graduate school after I got my bachelor's degree. I've started an MBA at night, but it's not the same. Work is all right, but I miss the friends and the fun that went along with the studying. Craig Phillips is a Wall Street stockbroker. I went to prep school, and then I went to Harvard. I guess you could say I had the best education money could buy, but it wasn't easy. We had to study very hard, and a lot was expected of us. The thing I remember most is the friendship. The friends I made then are still my friends today. Most of us were together in prep school and then at Harvard, too. Sports were very important for me. I believe that team sports teach people to work together, and competition with another team brings out the best in people. Anyway, discipline was stricter then. It's too bad that it's changed. Maybe young people would be better behaved nowadays if there was more discipline in the schools. My biggest regret is that I didn't have the family life other boys had. After age 12, I only saw my family at Christmas and in the summer. Colleen McGrath is a factory worker. School was just another part of neighborhood life. My brothers and sisters and I went to a parochial elementary school three blocks from home. Later, we had to take a bus to the public high school, but it was only a 10-minute ride. And then we all went to the local community college. I wish my kids could do that. I have to take the youngest in the car to the big elementary school across the river. A school bus picks up the other two who are in junior high school, and it takes them almost an hour each way. I wish things hadn't changed so much. Unit 44, New Year's 
It's 10 minutes before midnight, and we're going over live to Times Square in New York City. There are a quarter of a million people out there, and they're all waiting to celebrate the new year. Adam Vasquez is going to talk to just a few of them. How are you doing, Adam? Great, Naomi, just great. As you can see, there's a real party atmosphere down here. I'm going to move through the crowd and talk to some of the people who have come here. Excuse me, can I speak to you for a moment, please? Sure. What are your names and where are you from? I'm Robin, and this is my boyfriend, Phil. We're from New Jersey. New Jersey, just across the river. Are you having a good time? Great time. No problem. We watched the ball drop on TV ever since we were kids. This is the first time we've actually come in person. It's great, really great. Do you work in New Jersey? Yeah, I'm a nurse. Okay, Robin, I want to ask you one question, just one. If you could have one wish for next year, what would you wish for? A serious wish or just kidding around? You choose. Okay, if I could have one wish, I'd wish for three more wishes. That's against the rules, Robin. Well, seriously, I'd wish for an end to famine and starvation everywhere. Great. Thanks, and a happy new year to both of you. Unit 45, Operation Impossible. Now, 006, I want you to look at these pictures carefully. At last, we have the chance to break the biggest crime syndicate in the world. Smash! Look at the man on the right. He's the one we've been after for years. Who is he? We think he's the one that controls Smash. He's certainly the one that ordered the murder of 003, the one that planned the hijacking of the airplane full of world leaders, and the one that organized the biggest drug smuggling operation in the world. Do we know his name? Otto Krugerand. Otto Krugerand? Hmm, and who's that standing behind him? Ah, slow job. He's the bodyguard who travels everywhere with Krugerand, and the only person he trusts. He's an expert assassin. He's the one who fed 004 to the alligators. How charming. What about the woman? Don't you recognize her? Marla Powers. She's the one who arranged the pipeline explosion and then vanished into thin air. She's also Krugerand's wife and the only pilot he allows to fly his private plane. Who's the little guy wearing thick glasses? That's Professor Peratov. The mad scientist who defected from Moldania. He's an expert on laser technology and the first man who's been able to perfect a space laser weapon. Krugerand is planning to build a private space rocket which could put a satellite into orbit. Do you understand the importance of this 006? If they got a laser weapon into space, they could blackmail the world. Take a look at this picture, 006. It's an oil rig. It looks like it, doesn't it? It belongs to Krugerand's oil company. It's supposed to be drilling for oil in the Indian Ocean. Below it, there's a vast underwater complex. The superstructure looks odd. In fact, it conceals the launching pad they're going to use for the rocket. That must be a radar scanner there. Yes, it's the scanner they'll use to track the rocket. But they can also see anything that tries to get near the rig. It's going to be very difficult to get you in, 006. What's the plan, then? 
We are flying you to California tonight for two weeks of intensive mini-submarine training. That sounds like fun. Unit 46. Operation accomplished. When 006 reached the rig, he climbed up one of the towers. He needed to change out of his wetsuit. He went into an empty cabin, found some clothes just his size, and put them on. Suddenly, the guard whose cabin he was searching came in. Everything went dark. 006 woke up with his hands tied behind his back. His head was throbbing. He was apparently in some kind of control room. In the room were Otto Krugerand, Slowjob, Mala, and the guard whose clothes he was wearing. A beautiful woman whose hands were also tied was lying beside him. She was Pick Wells, an American agent 006 had met in Washington. 006 glanced at his watch. The explosive device he'd put on the rig was timed to explode in 40 minutes. Welcome, Commando Fleming. We've been expecting you, Otto said, smiling. Unfortunately, we won't have time to show you around. Slowjob will take you to feed the sharks. They must be very hungry by now. Slowjob escorted them to Krugerand's private apartment. One wall was made of thick glass. Behind it, 006 could see the dark shapes of the sharks swimming around. Slowjob pushed the two agents up a spiral staircase to a platform above the shark tank. He was careful to keep his gun trained on them all the time. You wouldn't refuse us a last cigarette, would you, Slowjob? 006 asked. I don't smoke, Slowjob grinned. And you shouldn't either. It's bad for your health. Now, come on, slow job. There are some cigarettes and a lighter in my jacket pocket. Okay, but don't try anything. Slow job reached into 006's pocket and took out the cigarettes and lighter. He took one cigarette out of the pack, pushed it into 006's mouth, and put the pack back into 006's pocket. Slow job pressed the lighter with his thumb. The sudden force of the flame took him by surprise. At that moment, 006 kicked him, and his gun fell to the floor. Slowjob tumbled backward and disappeared forever into the tank of sharks. The lighter had dropped to the floor and was still burning. 006 was able to burn through the ropes that held his hands. He quickly untied Pick, who picked up Slowjob's gun. We don't have much time, he said. Can you fly a helicopter? With my eyes closed, she replied. Good. Let's go. 006 and Pick tiptoed into the control room where Otto and Mala still were. Paratov had joined them. 006 fired the lighter at the control panel, which exploded and burst into flames. Otto tackled 006, and the lighter flew out of his hand. Mala and Paratov desperately tried to put out the flames. Pick pointed the gun at Mala, Otto, and Paratov, and ordered them to lie on the floor. Then she and 006 ran out of the room, locking it behind them. They ran up to the helicopter pad and quickly climbed into the helicopter. The helicopter soared into the sky. A few seconds later, there was a massive explosion as the rig blew up. Unit 47, Student Mastermind. Next contestant is Vicki McLean, who is a student at Porchtown High School. Okay, Vicki, 
You have two minutes in which to answer as many questions as possible. If you do not know the answer, say pass. I will then go on to the next question. If you answer incorrectly, I will then give the correct answer. You will get one point for each correct answer. Are you ready? Yes. Can you name the President of the United States whose early career began as a radio sports announcer? Uh, Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Correct. What is an instrument that shows the direction of north? A compass? Exactly. What is the date when France celebrates their revolution of 1789? The 14th of July. Correct. What do we call a person who always expects the best to happen? Uh, an optimist. Correct. Can you tell me the language that was spoken in the Roman Empire? Italian? No, wrong. The correct answer is Latin. What kind of person do people visit when they want advice about their marriage? Pass. Who was the Egyptian queen whose beauty was famous throughout the world? Cleopatra. That's correct. What's the kind of school where very rich people send their children before college? Uh, private school? Can you be more exact? No, I can't think of it. I'm afraid I can't give you that. We were looking for prep school or preparatory school. Now can you tell me? I've started, so I'll finish. Can you tell me the name of the French emperor whose final battle was at Waterloo? N Napoleon Bonaparte. Correct. And at the end of that round, Vicky McLean has scored six points. You passed on one. The kind of person people visit when they want advice about their marriage is a marriage counselor. Thank you. Can we have our next contestant, please? Unit 50. Relatives. Marjorie and Felix Hernandez have just come back from a vacation in San Francisco. They are showing photographs of their trip to their friends and neighbors, the Winters. These are our friends. They picked us up at the airport. And that's the cable car. It runs on California Street. This is Marjorie's friend. We visited her. This is the car. We rented it for two weeks. The tour guide was very knowledgeable. She spoke five languages. And this is Bart. Bart connects San Francisco to Oakland. It's Oakland Subway. You remember Maya and Molly, don't you, Joe? You haven't seen her since you were about 10. Well, she's 86 this year. We visited her at her apartment in San Francisco. And this is our tour group. The tour was fun. The hotel booked it for us. We bought a beautiful bowl from a potter. His store was in the Japan Center, and we met a lot of nice people. We met two sisters from Detroit. Their parents live in San Francisco. And this was taken at the restaurant in the hotel. Kevin Costley was sitting at a table next to ours. We saw his movie last week. Unit 51. Describing Things. Stolen Car. Police Department, Sergeant Wong speaking. My car's been stolen. It's gone. Okay, now calm down. Let me have your name and address. Richard Lockwood, 4512 Eisenhower Boulevard, apartment 18J. All right. Now give me a description of the missing vehicle. Well, it's a 95 Ford Escort, a light gray four-door model. Oh, it has a thin dark blue stripe along the sides and a dent in the left front fender. What's the license plate number? RJG1224. Hold on just a minute. 
Hello? I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that your car wasn't stolen. It was towed for illegal parking. The bad news is that it will cost you $150 to get it back. The Real Estate Agent Hello, Donna Wu speaking. Hi, Donna. This is Joyce Fine at Ivy Realty. I think I found a house you'll be interested in. Oh, terrific. What's it like? Tell me about it. Well, it's in Arrowhead, the section you wanted. It's a split-level, three-bedroom, red-brick house with white trim. It's only six years old and has a large country-style kitchen. How big a yard does it have? It's a one-acre lot with some nice-sized trees and a very pretty flower garden in back. When do you want to see it? Could we meet there tomorrow afternoon? It sounds perfect. Sure thing. Let's make it at 2 o'clock. Here's the address. Lost and Found Union Station Lost and Found Department, can I help you? Uh, hello. Yes, I hope so. I left my briefcase on the train this morning. I wonder if it has been turned in. Which train? Oh, the 840 from Concord. And what does your briefcase look like? Well, it's, um... Uh, an average size rectangular brown leather attaché case with brass locks. We have quite a few that fit that description. Did it have your name on it? No, not my name, but it has my initials by the handle, JFA. Hold on just a minute. Let me take a look. Unit 53, Presidential Debate. A few minutes before the presidential debate. Come on, Gary. Hurry up. The debate is about to start. How come you're so late? The battery was dead. I had to call Al from the garage to give me a jump start. Then I went back to the garage to get some gas and to get the battery recharged. Oh, no. Do we need a new battery? Probably. Not another expense. If it's not one thing, it's another. Oh, the debate's starting. We'll talk later. We interrupt our regular television schedule in order to bring you the following presidential debate. Good evening. I'm Carol Moore. As you know, three people are running for President of the United States. I will introduce them in a moment. In order to be fair, we will allow all three candidates to answer each question. Each candidate will be allowed a one-minute response to make sure everyone gets to express his or her opinion. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our three candidates. Mrs. Victoria Cranston, Mr. Ron Parrow, and Mr. Bob Noel. The first area I'd like to ask about is the economy. What are you going to do to make sure the economy improves? Mr. Paro, we'll start with you. You know, I'm a successful businessman, and I know how to make a lot of money. To get this economy back on its feet, we need to repeal the income tax increases of the last few years. In order to make up for the loss of revenue, I'll put a tax on gasoline. The gas tax would be just 10 cents per gallon per year for the next four years. And I do a bunch of things to help small business owners. 
We need to help small businesses in order to increase the number of good jobs. For the purpose of getting the economy moving again, I'll give tax credits to manufacturers. We have to sell things, folks, if we're going to make money. Oh, am I out of time already? Unit 54. Do it yourself. Do It Yourself magazine sponsors a contest every summer to find the winner of the annual Do It Yourself Award. This year, a married couple, Rudy and Irene Cipriani, won. A writer from Do It Yourself is interviewing them at their house. Well, I'm very impressed by all the work you've done on your house. How long have you been working on it? We became interested in do-it-yourself several years ago. Our son Paul was in an accident and lost the use of his legs. He's in a wheelchair. We had to make changes so that he could move around the house. There was no way we could afford to pay to have it done. We had to learn to do it ourselves. How did you go about learning? I decided to go to a vocational school at night so that I could learn cabinet making and electrical wiring. Later, Irene went so that she could study plumbing and general carpentry, too. Tell me about the kind of changes you made to the house. You know, you never realize the problems disabled people have until it affects your own family. Nowadays, most public buildings have ramps so that people in wheelchairs can get in, and buses have lifts so that people with disabilities can get on and off. But just imagine the problems Paul would have in your house. We needed wide halls so that he could move from one room to another. And we needed a big bathroom so that he could be as independent as possible. We had to change a lot. Where did you start? The electrical system. Rudy completely rewired the house so that Paul could turn on and off the lights and plug in appliances. We had to redo the whole house so that Paul could reach things and do what he wanted. What are you working on now? We've just finished redoing the kitchen so that Paul can do a little cooking. Now we're converting the garage into a workshop so that he can make some money fixing appliances. How do you plan to spend the $50,000 prize? We're hoping to start our own construction business so that we can do conversions for people with disabilities. Unit 56. A New Way of Life. Tonight on TV Close-Up, our correspondent Diana Romero will talk to some rat race dropouts, some very happy people who've given up regular jobs and high salaries to start a new way of life. I'm here in northern Vermont, where the nearest town is more than 25 miles away. Dan and Michelle Gallagher were born and lived most of their lives in Boston. Dan was vice president of marketing for a publishing company, and Michelle was an advertising executive. They gave up their jobs and moved to this remote area of Vermont four years ago. Michelle, what made you give up everything for this? Everything? A big house and expensive cars aren't everything. We used to work long hours. Such long hours, in fact, that we hardly ever saw each other. We wanted to do this years ago, but we were making so much money that we were afraid to quit our jobs. Even the time we spent at home was so hectic that we never had time to just be together. So, four years ago, 
We traveled around New England on vacation. We saw this place. It was for sale, and we liked it so much, we decided to buy it. The next week, we quit our jobs, sold most of our things, and here we are. How do you earn a living? We don't need a lot. We have two milk cows and a few chickens. We grow all our own vegetables. It's a simple life. We're still so busy that we work from dawn to dark, but we're together. And now we have Kimberly, who's three. We're happier than we've ever been. The motorcycle I'm sitting on is a very special one. Special because it's been all the way around the world. It belongs to Luke Musto, who has just come back here to Detroit after a three-year motorcycle trip. Luke, what led you to quit your job and make this trip? I worked in a car factory on the assembly line. I made good money, but it was really monotonous. It was so routine that I never had to think. My job is done by a robot now. <laughs> Big surprise. Anyway, I bought this bike secondhand, put two packs on the back, and got myself on a freighter to Europe. What did you do for money? I had a little money saved up, but of course it didn't last long. I had to find work where I could. I did a lot of different things. Picked fruit, washed dishes, worked as a mechanic. How did people react to you? Everywhere I went, people were so friendly that I always felt right at home. There was such a tremendous amount of interest in the bike that it was easy to start a conversation. Usually you can communicate without knowing the language. Did you ever feel like giving up and coming home? Only once, in Bangladesh. I got so sick from something I ate that I had to go to a hospital. But it didn't last long. You've had such an exciting time that you'll find it hard to settle down in Detroit, won't you? I'm not going to. Next week I'm leaving again, but this time I'm heading south to Tierra del Fuego. See you when I get back. Unit 57, last of the airships. At 7.20 p.m. on May 6, 1937, the world's largest airship, the Hindenburg, floated majestically over Lakehurst Airport, New Jersey, after an uneventful crossing from Frankfurt, Germany. There were 97 people on board for the first Atlantic crossing of the season. There were a number of reporters waiting to greet it. Suddenly, radio listeners heard the commentator screaming, Oh my God! It's broken into flames! It's flashing! Flashing! It's flashing terribly! Thirty-two seconds later, the airship had disintegrated, and thirty-five people were dead. The age of the airship was over. The Hindenburg was the last in a series of airships which had been developed over 40 years in both Europe and the United States. They were designed to carry passengers and cargo over long distances. The Hindenburg could carry 50 passengers in 25 luxury cabins with all the amenities of a first-class hotel. All the cabins had hot and cold water and electric heating. There was a dining room, a bar, and a lounge with a dance floor and a baby grand piano. The Hindenburg had been built to rival the great luxury transatlantic liners. It was able to cross the Atlantic in less than half the time of a liner. By 1937, 
it had carried 1,000 passengers safely and had even transported circus animals and cars. Its sister ship, the Graf Zeppelin, had flown over a million miles, 1.6 million kilometers, and had carried 13,100 passengers without incident. Nobody knows the exact cause of the Hindenburg disaster. The Hindenburg was filled with hydrogen, which is a highly flammable gas, and every safety precaution had been taken to prevent accidents. Sabotage has been suggested, but experts at the time believed that it was caused by leaking gas, which was ignited by static electricity. It had been waiting to land for three hours because of heavy thunderstorms. The explosion happened just as the first mooring rope, which was wet, touched the ground. The most surprising thing is that 62 people managed to escape. The fatalities were highest among the crew members, many of whom were working deep inside the airship. After the Hindenburg disaster, all airships were grounded, and until recently, they have never been seriously considered as a commercial proposition. Unit 59, the Washington, D.C. Metro. Traveling on the Washington Metro presents few difficulties for visitors because of the clear, color-coded map. At the bottom of the map, you will find fare and travel time information. You buy your fare card at one of the yellow vending machines. You can use nickels, dimes, quarters, $1, $5, $10, and $20 bills, and the machine will give you change. You have to use your fare card to enter the metro system by inserting it into the slot at the gate. It will be returned to you at the other side of the gate. Do the same thing when exiting the system. Piero and Margarita have just arrived at National Airport. Okay. We have to get to Deanwood. Can you see it? Yes, it's up here. It looks so easy. We just take the yellow line to Lanfang Plaza, then change to the orange line. It goes straight there. It's the seventh stop from L'Enfant Plaza. Betsy is at the information booth at the Pentagon. Excuse me, how do I get to Connecticut Avenue and Q Street? I mean, which is the nearest metro station? You want DuPont Circle. Take a look at the map. You take the yellow line to Gallery Place. Then you'll have to change for the red line. It's the third stop. I see. Or you could take the blue line to Metro Center and change to the red line there. Which way is faster? It's about the same. Well, thank you. Unit 60, the 6 o'clock news. And now, the 6 o'clock report with Jack Dennehy. Good evening. Thousands of Portstown residents marched on City Hall today to protest plans to build a state prison near the city. Although a light rain was falling, an estimated 5,000 people marched over a mile from Portstown High School to City Hall, where Governor Brown and Mayor Henry Flores were meeting to discuss the project. A new prison is needed because the other state prisons are overcrowded. 
Several sites for the new prison were considered, but Portstown was chosen because in the governor's words, all areas in the state must share the problems of our prison system. Although the protesters asked to meet with the governor, he refused and returned to the capital. After the governor's departure, however, the mayor met with the organizers of the march and explained his position. Four entire city blocks were evacuated this afternoon in Oceanside because of a gas explosion. The explosion occurred at 1.20 p.m. in a deserted building on 2nd Street. Fire department officials believe that the explosion was due to leaking gas. The building had been empty for several months, and they suspect that a gas main had cracked because of vibrations from work being carried out by the city on the street. Coast Guard helicopters went into action today after a yacht capsized in Coolidge Sound. Despite rain and high seas, the helicopters were able to rescue all but one of those aboard. Two men and two women were pulled to safety, but one of the men was pronounced dead on arrival despite the rescue team's efforts. The other three are in satisfactory condition. The fifth passenger, a woman, was not found. Although the Coast Guard continues its search, she is presumed drowned. The Coast Guard had issued a small craft warning this morning, but the yacht set out from the Newgate Marina in spite of the warnings. Incomplete reports have reached this station about a hundred mile an hour car chase on Portstown streets. Only minutes ago, according to these reports, Portstown police were alerted by an anonymous phone call and rushed to catch a gang that was breaking into a local discount clothing store. However, the gang of young males escaped in a late model car that allegedly had been stolen two days ago in Harbor City. The gang was armed and fired several times at the police cars behind them. Nevertheless, the police were able to run the gang's car off the road and arrest all the members with no injuries on either side. Now to sports. Portstown High School Stadium was filled last night when the Portstown Pirates played their traditional rivals, the Harbor City Raiders. Pirate quarterback Tony Rizzuto scored two touchdowns in the first half. Although the Raiders didn't score at all in the first half, they went on to win with two touchdowns and a field goal in the second half. In spite of the Pirates' good showing in the first half, they couldn't seem to do anything right in the second. The final score? Raiders 17, Pirates 14. Unit 62, The Company Picnic. Every year, the Austin, Texas operation of Lemon Computers gives a 4th of July picnic for all its employees and their families. The picnic is held at a lake near town, and everyone enjoys swimming, water skiing, boating, playing games, and especially eating the big barbecue lunch. Leslie Carbone works in the accounting department. She's talking to Diane Romberg, the personnel director. Hi, Diane. Was that your son, David, you were just talking to? Oh, hi, Leslie. Yeah, that was David. I don't know what to do with him. He never wants to play with the other kids. He certainly has grown since last year. Yeah, he's much taller than most kids his age. Oh, well. How do you like the picnic? Are you having a good time? Oh, yes. Great. I uh, wanted to ask you about that job in the New York office. It's definitely opening up. Are you still interested in it? I might be. I really don't know what to do. I'm really happy here in Austin, but it would be nice to be in New York. My family lives in New Jersey. 
Maybe I'll apply for it. Why not? Drop by my office next week and I'll tell you what I can about it. Of course, you have to decide what you want. Jackie Polito is in charge of the marketing department. She's just seen Bart Connors, who works in the advertising department. Jackie, I see you're back from your trip. Yes, I got in last night. How did it go? Fabulous. What I saw over there really surprised me. I think there'll be a lot of demand for our new C2L personal computer. That's very interesting. Yes, really. What I found was very encouraging. We have just what they're looking for. Richard Eng is the Lemon Computer's vice president who is in charge of the Austin operation. He's just run into Bob Ewing, who is the plant manager. Hi, Bob. It's another good picnic, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Did you get my memo about the meeting Wednesday? Yeah, 10 o'clock, right? Your memo didn't say what the meeting's about. It's not bad news, is it? No, don't worry. It's good news, in fact. What we need to do is increase production of the C2L. Either we'll have to go into overtime or we'll have to hire new people. Terrific! What we'll have to look at is how much each way will cost. Right, but we can cover the facts and figures on Wednesday. Let's not talk shop today. That's not what we're here for. You're right. Have you tried the barbecued ribs? Unit 63. New on the job. It's Alan Newman's first day on his first job. It's in the maintenance department of a large factory. Bert Hogg, who has worked there for 25 years, is showing Alan around. All right, son. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Where can I leave my jacket and things? There's a row of lockers over there. It doesn't matter which one you use. Take whichever one you want. Oh, thanks. And I have my social security card. They told me to bring it. Who should I show it to? Just take it up to personnel. You can show it to whoever is there. When can I do that? It really doesn't matter. Go whenever you want to, whenever it's convenient. Okay. Oh, another thing, Bert. Where can I park my motorcycle? There's plenty of room in the parking lot. Just don't put it in a space that's reserved. Other than that, you can leave it wherever there's room. Come on, I'll show you where you'll be working. In here. That's your workbench, and your stool is here. Just watch me at first and do whatever I tell you, okay? Okay. First of all, you can clean these tools. There's some solvent in that bottle on the shelf. All right. Is there any special way to do it? Huh? A special way? Uh, no, Alan. Clean them however you want to. There's no special way. 10.30 Come on, Alan. You can stop for a while. It's time for a break. Thanks. Don't thank me, son. You're doing a good job. It's time for a cup of coffee, or whatever you want. Oh, and after the break, I want you to go to the supply room and get me a few things, okay? Sure. Good. I need a can of striped paint, a rubber hammer and a glass nail, a left-handed screwdriver, and a bucket of steam. Just tell them Bert sent you. At the supply room. Hi there. Hi there. I'm here to get a can of striped paint. Uh, what? What are you talking about? 
I was sent here to pick up a can of striped paint. And what wise guy told you to do that? Bert. Bert Hogg. Oh, Bert Hogg. I see. What color stripes would you like? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'd better ask him. I suppose he told you to get a right-handed screwdriver, too. No, he wants a left-handed one. Think about what you're saying. Just stop and think. But Bert said... Oh. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, excuse me. A few minutes later... What took you so long, Alan? Well, the supply room didn't have what you wanted, so I filled out a requisition form and took it to the president's office. You've been here so long that I'm sure he'll approve whatever you need. Unit 65. Visual Gossip. And now, it's time for the Stargaze Minute with your host, Cindy Barrett. Hi, everyone. I'm Cindy Barrett, and have I got news for you. This exclusive just in. The 37-year-old Duchess of Lichtenberg is planning a secret wedding in Monte Carlo in June. But you'll never guess who she's marrying. Her limo driver. I guess the multimillionaire got tired of the single life, or it got tired of her. Hugely successful thriller writer Michael Brighton is getting a divorce from his wife of 21 years. She must not fit in with his new Beverly Hills mansion, his sports cars, or his late-night lifestyle. Beautiful and talented Julia Robbins will star as an American tourist on vacation in Europe. The 18-year-old actress will be getting a cool $10 million for her role. This will certainly help pay her legal fees from her messy court case against her former employer, World Studios. Is handsome, Oscar-winning Keith Southern, who just broke off his engagement to supermodel Kate Roth, dating someone new? Friends of the 30-year-old Keith say no, but we've all seen the pictures of his romantic, candlelit dinner with yet another super-beautiful supermodel, Corin Collins. I'm sure we'll hear more about this couple. Talented, wealthy singer Niles Lovett, who just got a divorce from his wife of 15 years, is going to be an actor. Sources say that the country and western superstar will play the lead role in the movie Country Living. And finally, sexy 35-year-old senator from Nebraska, Jenny Dewright, has been dancing the night away at all the hottest Washington and New York night spots while her husband stays home with the twins. The mother of two, famous as the first woman to walk in space in a stylish jumpsuit, is the youngest female senator in history. That's all for now. More Star News tomorrow. Back to you, Peter. Unit 67. It's about time. Janet and Bruce live in Houston. Janet's younger sister, Pam, who lives in Denver, is flying down to spend a long weekend with them. Bruce, I think it's time to go and meet Pam at the airport. Oh, no. There's no need to hurry. There's plenty of time. It's only 8.30. There won't be much traffic at this time of night. You never know. And I think your watch must be slow. I have 8.40. I'd rather be too early than too late. It'll take her a while to get her luggage. Oh, come on, Bruce. It's time we were leaving. We can always have some coffee at the airport. I'd rather see the end of the basketball game, but never mind. We'd better go. 
Janet, wait a minute. The phone's ringing. Hello? Oh, Pam, where are you? I'm still in Denver. The flight's been delayed. You caught us just in time. Oh, good. The plane won't be leaving for another hour at least. Look, don't bother to come out to the airport. It's no trouble. We'll meet you. No, I'd really rather you didn't. Honestly. Now, don't be silly, Pam. We'll pick you up. No, Janet, I'd rather get a taxi. We'll be there, Pam. See you later. Oh, Bruce, there she is. It's about time. Janet, Bruce, <laughs> it's wonderful to see you, but I'm really embarrassed. It's almost 1230. Well, we couldn't let you find your own way. Not at this time of night. Do we have to wait for the luggage or uh, is that all you have? No, this is it. I didn't check anything. Great. It always takes forever at this airport. I know. It's about time they did something about it. I'll go and get the car. I won't be long. Well, Pam, what would you rather do tomorrow morning? Sleep in or go shopping? You mean this morning? I'd rather go shopping, but there's no need for you to come with me. I'd rather you slept in. You must be exhausted. Besides, it isn't as if this were my first visit to Houston. Unit 68, the New York Police Force. Thanks for inviting me to speak at your career assembly. You've asked me to talk about what it's like being a police officer. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. It's no picnic being a police officer in New York, and you have to be sure it's what you really want to do. When people need your help, they're only too happy to see you. But show up when they don't want you, and what you can get called isn't fit to print. You arrive for work and have no idea what the day will bring. A traffic accident or a murder, an armed robbery or a false alarm, a request for directions or a drug overdose. I get asked about treatment for sick canaries, social security payments, politics and prison visits. I have to deal with family conflicts. I get anonymous threatening letters and phone calls, and a lot of times I recognize who they're from. I rarely complete a holiday shift, especially Christmas, without having to report a suicide, usually caused by loneliness. Every day there are drunks, fights, bodies, demonstrations, the brutal and the brave. The villains and the victims, the haters and the lovers, and the just plain indifferent. It isn't easy. What kind of person measures up to such a job? Any one of you. There's no minimum height requirement. You can be tall or short. But regardless of your height, you're obviously no good if you don't have the stature for the job. This means having concern for people, a real sense of fair play, and common sense. And if you don't have a sense of humor, <laughs> forget it. These qualities are more important than qualifications, although you need some of those too. You have to be a high school graduate and at least 20 years old to get into the police academy. And those exams are tough. First, you have to pass a written exam. If you make it through that, you have to take a physical exam. And you'd better be in good shape. If you pass that, you go to the police academy for six months. Now... The pay starts at about $26,000 a year, and believe me, you'll learn every penny of it. You'll have to put up with lonely hours on the night shift, and you'll probably work every Christmas. But the rewards you can get for doing a good job will more than compensate for the low pay. 
if I haven't dimmed your enthusiasm and you're still interested, you can do two things. First, read a few books written by ex-cops. They'll tell you plenty. And also, get in touch with the Department of Personnel, 55 Thomas Street, New York, New York. Or call them at 212-566-8790. They'll tell you when the next exam is being given. Thanks a lot, and good luck. Unit 70, Gold Rush. California. In 1848, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill, about 100 miles east of San Francisco, and the first great gold rush began. Within a year, 100,000 people, only 8,000 of whom were women, had reached the coast of California. More than half of them had traveled overland across the American continent. Gold fever began to spread. Homes, farms, and stores were abandoned as everybody raced for California. Many came by sea, and in July 1850, more than 500 ships were anchored in San Francisco Bay, many of which had been deserted by gold-hungry sailors. A few people became fabulously rich, but it was a risky business. Law and order broke down. Even if a miner struck it rich, there were always those who would try to take it away. Gamblers, outlaws, thieves, and saloon keepers. Australia The next major gold rush occurred in 1851, when gold was struck in New South Wales, Australia. This led to another stampede, and many rich finds were made. Other discoveries were made in Victoria and Kalgoorlie, Western Australia. In some places, massive nuggets of gold were found accidentally, just lying on the ground. The Welcome Stranger Nugget, which was found in 1869, weighed almost 173 pounds, 78.47 kilos. The Yukon Perhaps the most difficult conditions were experienced by those prospectors who braved the Canadian winters to win gold from the Yukon and Klondike rivers. On August 16, 1896, three prospectors struck gold in Bonanza Creek, a tributary of the Klondike River, and then in a second creek which was named El Dorado. In the Yukon, gold was obtained by washing gravel from riverbeds, and soon as much as $800 worth of gold was being taken from a single pay of dirt. Within a year, Dawson had grown from nothing to a town of 30,000 people. Everybody who entered the country had to carry a year's supply of food and mining equipment over steep and frozen mountain passes. Horses and donkeys died in the ice and snow, but the people kept on going. It is estimated that of the 100,000 people who set out for the Klondike, fewer than 40,000 actually arrived. Only 4,000 ever found gold, and very few of these became rich. South Africa By the turn of the century, gold had been found in South Africa and this laid the foundation for the world's largest gold mining industry. Today, South Africa accounts for 70% of world gold production. Vast sums of money are being invested, and modern mining technology is being used to squeeze gold from the rock. 20th Century Gold Rush New finds are being made in the former Soviet Union, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. The largest single mine in the world was discovered in Uzbekistan, then a Soviet Republic, in 1958. However, in spite of recent finds, modern-day gold rushes are usually confined to speculation on the gold markets of Zurich, London, and New York. 
At times of economic uncertainty, investors rush hysterically to buy gold and the price soars, often only to fall back again. Gold fever is in many ways irrational, but historically gold has always held its value, and it is likely that in an uncertain world it will continue to do so. Unit 71. The circus is coming. This is What's New, Portstown, Delaware's favorite radio talk show. I'm your host, John Barca. In the studio with me is Sandy Farnham, the daughter of famous circus owner T.P. Farnham. Sandy, the circus will be here in Portstown for two weeks. That's right, isn't it? Yes, that's right, John. We open tomorrow for two weeks. Has the circus arrived yet, Sandy? No, not yet. It's on the road somewhere between New Jersey and here. I suppose there's a lot to be done between now and the first show. Yes. I've already been here for three days. There were all the advance arrangements to be made. It's like preparing for a small invasion, I guess you could say. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, there are so many things to be done, you know. There are posters to be put up, newspaper ads to be arranged, local workers to be hired. It goes on and on. When will the circus actually arrive? In the next hour or two. The first truck should be arriving any minute now, and then the hard work really begins. Most people love the circus, but not many realize how much work there is, do they? That's right. We'll be working all day and most of the night. It's a lot like moving a small army, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed. By tomorrow morning, everything will have been set up in time for the afternoon performance. But first, there's the big parade down Main Street at 11.30. Don't forget to come out and see us. Thank you, Sandy, for coming in to talk to us. Now, don't forget, folks, the big circus parade will start from the pier at 11.30. Go along Main Street past the high school and end in Lincoln Park. Farnham Circus will be in town for two weeks, until August 28th. Now for our next guest, we have a most... Unit 72, Getting Things Done. Tim... That bathroom faucet is still dripping. It's driving me crazy. I thought you said you were going to fix it. Oh, yeah. The washer needs replacing. Why don't you replace it then? That's easier said than done. I think you'd better call a plumber and get it done. I'm not really sure how to do it. Sorry, Mom. Mark and Tina are going on vacation next week. They're driving to Las Vegas. Mark always gives Tina a lift to work. He's dropping her off outside her office. Tina, I won't be able to pick you up from work tonight. I'm having the car tuned up. I thought we'd better have it done before we go. Good idea. When are you picking it up? At a quarter to six. Why? Well, I want to have my hair done before we leave. I'll try to make an appointment to get it done after work. Then you can pick me up at the hairdresser's. Okay. Call me at work and let me know what time, okay? All right. I'll call you later. Bye. Unit 74. Don't panic. Don't forget to fasten your seat belts. Please do not leave your seat while the seat belt light is on. Please look at the monitors for information about safety procedures. For further information, please consult the card in the seat pocket in front of you. 
May we remind passengers that smoking is prohibited on this flight. Smoking in the lavatories or tampering with the smoke detectors is a federal offense. Would you like to see the cockpit? I'll bring you a blanket in a minute. I'm afraid that we've run out of chicken dinners. Here's the headset. Let me help you. We're going through some turbulence. Please keep your seat belts fastened. We're going to make an emergency landing. Follow instructions. Don't panic. Leave your things and proceed directly to the emergency exits. Come on, you can make it. Just slide down the chute. I'll have to push you. Unit 75. Messages. It's Tuesday morning. Peter Daniels has just returned to the office. Look at the messages and listen to Rosa's report. Good morning, Rosa. Could you come in for a minute, please? Good morning, Peter. Did you have a good trip? Yes, thanks. It went very well. You had a few messages yesterday. Should I run through them? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Judy called. She said she wouldn't be in until Friday. Oh? Why is that? Mm, she said she had the flu. Okay. What else? George came in looking for you. He said he wanted tomorrow off. Did he say why? Yes. He told me his grandmother had died and he'd have to go to the funeral. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'd better talk to him later on. Uh, then Joe Watkins called. He said he couldn't make the meeting this afternoon, but uh, would call you on Wednesday morning. Unit 76, giving peace a chance. This is One Hour, and I'm Barbara Waters. Tonight, an interview with Sanderstan's Prime Minister, Simon Prokova who earlier this week in Davos, Switzerland, signed an historic peace agreement between Sandistan and the new country of Deseret. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Good evening. Mr. Prime Minister, the world is simply amazed and delighted that your country signed this peace agreement. What was the immediate effect of this peace agreement? The first thing was an immediate ceasefire. Have both parties honored the ceasefire? Oh, yes, uh, so far. What will happen next? Well, now we have to begin talks to work out the details. Are you going to relocate your citizens who live in the new country of Deseret? That is one of the many things we have to work out. But will they want to be relocated? After all, they have built homes there. If they don't want to be relocated, can they continue to live there after our troops are no longer there to protect them? Will the other people who live there be able to govern themselves? That's a good question. I'm sure they want to govern themselves. But I'm not sure that that will be economically possible. Do you think they can get help from other nations? Absolutely. I'm sure Deseret's leaders would never have entered into these agreements without assurances of some economic aid. Will you cooperate with the new government? After all, you once considered them rebels. Well... We will have to move slowly, of course, but I'm sure that with time, relations will become normal. 
Are your people happy about the prospect of peace? Those who believe that we will really have peace are happy. But some people are having trouble trusting our old enemies. They don't believe we are free from war and terrorism yet. When do you think all the details will be settled? It's hard to say. We are all willing to work very hard in the next few weeks. I would like to say that it will take one or two months, but I really don't know. It depends on how smoothly things go. Where are you going to hold the first negotiations? First we are going to Oslo, Norway. Then we are going to Paris. Maybe we won't have to go anywhere else after that. Well, the whole world will be hoping for your success. Thank you for being with us here tonight, Mr. Prime Minister. Peace. Unit 77. Trust the heart. Melissa sat alone by the empty swimming pool, watching the sun begin to set behind the palm trees into the ocean beyond. She sat as she had done so many times, thinking of that last fight two weeks before. She remembered how Don had at first denied being with Teresa, but then, when she had forced him to admit it, how he had apologized and begged her for forgiveness. She frowned a little as she thought of her harsh words and how Don, the only man she had ever really loved, had broken down and cried like a baby when she had refused to see him again. That was two weeks ago, and she had heard nothing from him since. She hadn't wanted to call him. She might want to admit that she had been unfair or to tell him how much she regretted calling him a liar. She might even say that she hadn't meant to hurt him. Then she would be a liar, too. She had meant every word. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps startled her. She turned, and through the gloom, she thought she could make out Don's familiar figure. Was it him? Could it possibly be? The approaching figure stepped into the last patch of sunlight and the last rays of the setting sun illuminated his dark, curly hair. He stopped, unsure of himself. Oh, Don, she said softly, trying to control her voice. What are you doing here? Melissa, he cried. Don't send me away. She sighed deeply as he ran to where she sat. He took her hands tightly in his. My darling, he whispered. Can you ever forgive me? I, she started but checked herself. I guess I'm partly to blame, but he interrupted her. That's all in the past. Let's not ever talk about it again, not ever. Darling, promise me something. What? she asked cautiously. Here, this is for you. Please, please accept it and wear it forever. He drew a small leather box from his pocket and leaned forward to give it to her. Suddenly the box fell from his grasp. He bent to pick it up, and at that moment his glasses slipped from his nose. Damn! Now where have they gone? I can't see a thing without them, he explained. Melissa leaned over the arm of her chair to help him. There was a crunch as his foot crushed the glasses. Oh, no. Now I've stepped on them, he exclaimed. Why can't I do anything right? Why do I always ruin everything? Her laughter pealed around the pool. Oh, Don, you are incredible. Who could hate somebody like you? I might even love you. Come here. Unit 78 and they lived happily ever after. When 
when Simon and I met three years ago, I remember telling all my friends that he was my Prince Charming. Later, when we had gotten to know each other really well, I told him about it. So he started calling me Cinderella. Right after we decided to get married, we heard that we could get married at Disney World. Well, not in the park itself, but at the hotels that are part of Disney World. We couldn't resist. Rachel looked beautiful. She was wearing a long white satin gown, and she rode to the reception in a glass carriage drawn by six magnificent white horses. I was waiting for her outside the hotel, along with one hundred guests. The ceremony was lovely. We had decided to write our own vows, but apart from that, we had the usual traditional service. We brought along our own minister from Cincinnati, and my maid of honor was my sister. Simon's best man was his best friend, and the ushers and bridesmaids were friends and cousins. All the men wore tuxedos, and all the women wore long gowns. I walked down the aisle to the traditional "Here comes the bride." But after the ceremony, Simon and I walked out to the theme of Beauty and the Beast. The reception was amazing. It all took place in front of a sixty-foot-tall replica of Cinderella's castle, complete with twinkling lights. Actors playing the roles of the fairy godmother and Cinderella's stepsisters mingled with the guests. Between eating and dancing, you know the normal things that people do at weddings. There were three stage shows. For the finale, the cast performed "When You Wish Upon a Star," and fireworks erupted from the roof. The food was wonderful, by the way, and fit into the whole Cinderella theme. For dessert, each guest got a chocolate slipper filled with mousse. When it was time for us to leave, we got back into the glass carriage and rode away. It was a beautiful day, a real fairy tale come true. And now we get to live happily ever after. Unit eighty, departures. Yoshiko Kyo has been studying English at a college in California. She'll finish the course at the end of this week. She's going back home to Tokyo on Saturday. Streamline taxi. I like a cab to San Francisco International Airport for Saturday morning, please. Okay. There'll be three of us. How much will it be? What's your address? I'm at one twenty-eight Cortland Avenue. We charge forty-five dollars for that trip. Forty-five dollars each? No, that's all together. What time do you want to leave? Check-in time is twelve noon, but I don't know how long it takes to get there. Well, we'd better pick you up at eleven o'clock, just in case traffic is heavy. Let me have your name and address. Yes, okay. The first name is Yoshiko. That's Y. O S H I K O, and the last name's Kyo, K Y O. Kyo, one twenty-eight Cortland Avenue. Okay, eleven o'clock Saturday morning. Thank you. Come in. Hi, Mr. Berman. Do you have a minute? I just stopped in to say goodbye. Oh, going back to Japan. When do you leave? Tomorrow. My flight is at two o'clock. Well, have a good trip back. It's been nice having you here, Yoshiko. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Well,、uh, I just wanted to thank you and all the other teachers. We've all enjoyed having you as a student. I've really learned a lot. I hope to come back next year on vacation. Send us a postcard and let us know how you're doing, and come see us if you do get back. I'll do that. Oh, there's the bell.
Bye, Yoshiko. Have a good trip. Bye, Mr. Berman, and thanks again for everything. Carlos, I'm glad I didn't miss you. Hi, Yoshiko. When are you leaving? Tomorrow, around 11 o'clock. I guess I won't see you again, so goodbye. It's been great knowing you. That sounds so final. Let's keep in touch, okay? Oh, sure. You have my address, don't you? Yeah. And remember, if you're ever in Caracas, look me up. I'd love to see you again. Oh, I will. You can count on that. And you do the same if you're ever in Tokyo. Sure. Well, goodbye. Bye, Carlos. Take care. Yoshiko, the taxi's here. Are you ready? Do you have everything? Yes, thank you, Mrs. Simmons, and thank you again. Thank you, Yoshiko, for the pretty plant. Now don't forget to write as soon as you get home, just to let us know that you got there safe and sound. Okay, or maybe I'll call when the long distance rates are low. The time difference is a mess, but I'll make sure I don't call in the middle of the night. You're so sweet, Yoshiko. Goodbye now. You'd better not keep the taxi waiting. Travel safely. Bye. Bye. Uh, take care. Uh, say goodbye to Mr. Simmons for me. Bye. <laughs> 